<laughs> I don't. Uh, I don't really know how to follow that. So uh, it's good to be here this morning with you. I'm glad that you're here. Why don't you turn to your neighbor and say, "I'm glad that you are here this morning." Turn to your other neighbor and say, "You look great this morning." And I'll tell you what, it's a, it's a sin to lie in church, so just so you know. But a uh, uh, little plug quickly, come back tonight, support uh, our, our graduates, uh, just love on them. We'll have a little reception right, right after the service in the student campus with some, some cake and some fellowship. So join us back tonight. But uh, I'm super honored uh, to be able to share a word and something honestly that God has been doing in my heart, in my life for the past six months, and it's changed everything about me. It's changed how I view God, uh, my relationship with Him. And so uh, none of this is a a preaching down to you. None of this is, oh, we pastors are good, but you know, you guys got to shape up. This is something collectively uh, as the body of Christ, as a family that we we need, we need more of. And so we're just uh, talking this morning about what it really means to follow Jesus. Foundationally, peeling back the layers of being a Christian. What does it mean? And you, you may be thinking, well, I've heard a message like this before. I've heard it a thousand times. I know what it means. I challenge you to, to not to check out this morning. Uh, because if you've been serving Jesus for one day or you've been serving Jesus all your life for many years, it doesn't matter. This applies to us and it's life-changing. So um, I... Uh, I want to give you an opportunity to encounter the person of Jesus at the end of service today, because that's what the, that's what this is all about: uh, meeting with Jesus and knowing Him more. And so, um, but I want to propose this to you first. Uh, well, let's pray because we need prayer. God, I just thank you this morning for what you have in store. I pray that you'd move me out of the way and move your Holy Spirit in place. I pray that you'd speak to us and that we'd encounter you in a new way. In your holy name. And everybody said. Amen. Amen. So I want to propose this to you that I truly believe that Jesus is the most known and the least known person in human history. Um, He is widely recognized but widely misunderstood. And so let me ask you this, um, and it's quite the challenging question. Um, Why do we feel more comfortable telling people that we believe in God rather than we follow Jesus? It's easier to say, man, yeah, I believe in God. I believe in God. But when you move to a place of saying, I follow Jesus, that makes you a little weird. That makes you a little radical. That makes you super spiritual. And uh, the outsiders are even within the church. We tend to not use that phrase as much as we should. Um, We would never say or say it out loud that we want our relationship with Jesus to be comfortable predictable, an easy way just to make our lives more happy. We'd never say that out loud, but we certainly act like we do when we come to church and when we live our lives. Uh, Back in uh, around 90 AD, uh, an ancient philosopher uh, named Ptolemy came up with this revolutionary new view that he felt like he discovered that the earth was the center of the universe. The sun revolved around it, and everything revolved around the earth. This was called geocentrism. Turn to your neighbor and say, geocentrism. Come on, 1030, you're supposed to be a little more alive than 8 o'clock. Say, geocentrism. Thank you. Come on. And uh, Plato and Aristotle made this famous. And it was widely known, and we know today... That that's not true, obviously. We are, the earth is such a small part of the vast universe and we revolve around a vast sun that we are so small. Um, But I believe in Christianity and in the family of God that there's something that I coined that I'm calling meocentrism. Meocentrism. And it's the fact that I am at the center of the universe and the son of God revolves around me. He revolves around my schedule, my time, my finances. Ooh, that hurt. He revolves around everything that I want to do. He revolves around my comfort. And uh, that's not what we were created for. And uh, we certainly know that Jesus 
is the center. He should be the center of our lives, that we should be orbiting around him. No matter, uh, actually, if you look in an orbit, it's not a perfect circle. It's more like an oval. It kind of goes out and loops back in. Whether you're on the outside of that orbit, it, you're being pulled back to Jesus. Whether you're on the close side of that orbit, you're being pulled to Jesus. Everything revolves around him as it should. But sometimes we don't act like it. We don't show that. And so how do we in our lives move from a place of me-centered to Jesus-centered? Um, well, turn in your Bibles with me to John chapter 6, uh, verse 26. little backstory for you here. So Jesus had just uh, fed the 5,000, did an amazing miracle, fed the 5,000 with the little boy's lunch. He sends the disciples on the lake. They encounter a storm. He walks on the water and saves them, calms the storm. He, uh, they get to the other side of the shore, and this, this crowd who he just fed uh, before is there, and more people are starting to gather to follow him. And this is where we pick up in verse 26. Jesus says, I tell you the truth. You want to be with me because I fed you, not because you understood the miraculous signs. Don't be so concerned about perishable things like food. Spend your energy seeking the eternal life that the Son of Man can give you, for God the Father has given me the seal of his approval. Jesus pretty much just says to this crowd, he, he pretty much is saying, hey, I know what you came here for. You came here for what you can get from me, not because you actually want me. He's kind of calling them out. And we pick up in verse 28. They replied, we want to perform God's works too. What should we do? Jesus told them. Uh, this is the only work God wants from you. Believe in the one he has sent. They answered, show us a miraculous sign if you want us to believe in you. They said, what can you do? What can you do, Jesus? After all, our ancestors ate manna while they journeyed through the wilderness. The scriptures say Moses gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus says, I tell you the truth. Moses didn't give you bread from heaven. My father did. Now he offers you the true bread from heaven. The true bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, give us that bread every day. Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. These people are coming to Jesus for what they can get from him and not actually seeking Jesus as a person. And they were wanting the physical and Jesus is trying to give them the spiritual to provide for them. Um, essentially, these people, this crowd, was more focused on what they could get instead of who was giving it to them. And I believe the church, and once again, this is what God has been working on my heart, is that we sometimes are saying what those people are saying in the midst of Jesus. Jesus, what can I get? What can you do for me, Jesus? We come to church, we come on Wednesdays, Maybe we have our devotional time, and the fundamental phrase, maybe not spoken, but thought, is, Jesus, what can you do for me? What can you do for me today, Jesus? Um, we often seek the product and not the provider. And uh, Jesus proclaims, I am the bread of life. I'm your source of life. Seek me and me only, the person of me. Get to know me, and you don't have to go anywhere else. You won't have to look anywhere else. And, and don't go after what you can get, but go after who you can get. Because once you get Jesus, everything else is a byproduct. You need peace in this place? You don't seek peace, you seek Jesus. You need finance help, you need relational help, you need healing physically, emotionally, spiritually. You don't seek those things when you come here. We seek Jesus. And that's just a byproduct. That's what he gives us through intimacy with him and that's what he's trying to explain to the people. And I, I believe he's explaining that to us this morning. So then the people were starting to murmur and uh, saying, he's claiming he's from heaven. He's claiming that his father is God. He's claiming all these crazy things. I didn't read it, but next Jesus claims, hey, if you, if you want to be truly a follower, you got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. Now Jesus wasn't saying that physically, because that would be weird. Um, but he's saying that metaphorically as the bread of life, the, our source, our provider. And uh, it says in verse 60, many of his disciples, 
disciples, not just randoms, not just crowd, not just spectator, many of his disciples said, this is very hard to understand. How can anyone accept it? And in verse 66, it says, at this point, many of his disciples turned away and deserted him. Then Jesus turned to his 12 disciples and asked a very important question. Are you also going to leave? Are you going to leave me too? Simon Peter proclaims, Lord, to whom would we go? Where would we go, God? Who else would we go to? You have the words that give eternal life. We believe and we know you are the Holy One of God. The people left after Jesus is giving this sermon, pretty much telling them, don't seek anything else but me. And they couldn't handle it. Um, And it wasn't a lack of explanation. It was a lack of encounter for these people. Jesus was saying they had the info about Jesus. They knew about it. They knew what he was saying. They even were bantering back and forth about the Old Testament. But what they lacked was an encounter with Jesus. God with Jesus. And that's why we see Peter so boldly answer, who else would we go to? Peter knew Jesus personally. He followed him every day. He had encounters with him every day, as did the 12. And who's the only ones that stayed? Who's the only ones that truly followed him? The people that encountered him. And uh, they had the information, the crowd had the information from Jesus, but what they lacked was the revelation of Jesus himself in their lives. And so this morning, my challenge to you is we can't follow Jesus off what we know about him. You have to have the revelation of Jesus. You could sit here and say, man, I have all the info about the Bible, about Jesus. I'm following him. You cannot truly follow, you cannot truly be changed enough by Jesus unless you know him as a person and meet with him daily, encounter him. Um, How many of you like steak in this place? Where's my people at? Come on, you saved people. Uh, I love steak. And uh, I went to North Central University, uh, and uh, when I was there, I was poor, uh, which is okay, poor college kid. And uh, I was volunteering uh, at a youth ministry, and one of my students who I'd really been pouring into and just loving on, his, uh, his dad happened to be really wealthy, and recognized that I was poor, so his dad said, hey, why don't we take you out to eat? And I was like, let's go, free food, right? Let's go. Uh, enough of that mac and cheese stuff in the microwave. Um, and I didn't know he was, where we were going to go, but he, we, he took me to this place, this steakhouse called Murray's Steakhouse. I don't know if you ever heard of it, but it is amazing. It is like top rated. Everybody knows about it. That is the place to go. Uh, so we go there. It's prestigious. You walk in. It's crazy. We sat down. We had a meal. Us three. We had a steak, obviously, some potatoes, and some green beans. And our meal cost almost five hundred dollars. <laughs> Woo! That as a penny pusher hurt me a little bit. I'm like, I just I'm gonna throw that up and put it on a plate and keep it in my fridge so I can just look at it for a little while, maybe touch it every once in a while, be like, dude, that's awesome, that's $500 on that plate. Uh, But this steak, uh, I can't can't even describe the steak to you. I mean, Lord help me. That was the best steak I've ever had. It was the best steak I've ever had in my life. And you know what Murray's Steakhouse did to me? I, I, I joke about this. Murray's Steakhouse ruined steak for me. It did. Every time I have steak, and, and I, my granddaddy and my grandma Shirley are watching, and my granddad makes mean steak. I mean, best you ever had. Sorry, granddad. Psst, Murray's puts you to shame, okay? <laughs> puts you to shame. I, I mean, Murray's was amazing. And what it did every time I eat steak, do you know what I think of? Murray's. I think of that steak. It stuck with me. And uh, it made every other steak, most other meals, look dull. Do you see where I'm going with this? When you meet Jesus, not just know him, not just read the Bible, not just, when you meet Jesus, everything else becomes dull. Everything that the world can offer you, the people the world can offer you, becomes dull. It nothing compares to the beauty, the majesty, the provision, the, the relationship that Jesus can offer you. And I want that this morning for you. 
Like I said, you can be anywhere in your walk with Jesus. Maybe you're sitting here in this place and you're like, I've never encountered Jesus. Well, he wants to meet you this morning and change your life forever. If you think about our life and our walk, it's, it's really hard to prioritize time with Jesus. Why? Because maybe we haven't fully encountered him as so amazing and so incredible. Because if we did, I would think in my own life, I would move mountains to move my schedule to meet with that kind of guy, with that God that can change me, that everything else doesn't even matter anymore, right? And oftentimes what I've seen in my own life, once again, because God's working on my heart, is that I kind of almost became bored with Jesus. I grew up going to church every night pretty much. I've heard it all. I've seen it all. I've read it all, right? I know all about Jesus, but that's, that's my problem. I know all about him. I wasn't having personal encounters with him every single day, every single day that would change me. And that, that life is not boring. That life is crazy. It's wild. It's adventurous. It's unpredictable. It's not comfortable, right? Meeting with Jesus. You think of the greatest examples of faith in the Bible. We turn to you know, Hebrews in the hall of faith, and it, guys listed like Enoch and Noah and Abraham, if you look back at their stories, they all have one thing in common, not that they worked for God or knew about him, but they walked with him. If you, if you break down the Hebrew of walk there, it means to walk habitually, consistently, as a regular habit of relationship and not knowledge. They were with Jesus, they were with God. That's it. That's what set them apart. And look at the stuff that they did. That's why they're in the hall of faith. We even look back at Peter who answers this question so perfectly that Jesus proposes in Matthew 16. He has an encounter with the mighty God. And what does God do for him? He changes his name. Changes his whole life. And back in that culture, you had a name change. It changed your whole identity. How people knew you how people saw you, how they defined who you were. And so when you encounter Jesus, when you encounter that stake of Jesus, man, it doesn't just allow you to follow him like the disciples. It doesn't just allow you to, um, you know, walk with him and have this mighty, crazy life, but actually it changes you. It, 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 uh, it, It really actually helps you find out who you are because when you find out who Jesus really is, you find out who you really are. We love to think that through our life, we are defined by what we do, what we have done, what we say, or what we possess, or who's around us. But the only thing that defines who we are is what Jesus did on that cross to make a way that we could have a real relationship and encounter with a mighty God who loves us and wants a relationship every day. That's the only thing that defines us. That's the only thing that can define us. And so through intimacy, you find identity with Jesus. So think about that. Without Jesus, you're truly not who you're supposed to be. You're truly not yourself without Jesus. And uh, we can really know Jesus and truly know ourselves. If you look at Jesus his teaching, his ministry as a whole, um, his, his main focus wasn't read my Bible, read my words, uh, understand and apply it. That wasn't his ministry at all. That's not what he taught. That's not what he was there for. And, uh, but in church, pastors, people, Christians, we just accept that for me to grow, I have to understand and apply, Right? I've, in my own life, that's what I did. I said, if I want to be a better Christian, if I want to follow Jesus more, I need to understand what he's saying. I'm going to dive into that word, and I'm going to apply what it says. That's not what Jesus came for. That's not what he preached. And uh, he said, instead of you applying things, why don't you start attaching your life to me? You know what I mean? And uh, there's two different things that I, I feel like this understand and apply method for growth, method for life as a Christian, it does, it causes two things in us. The first thing is that it assumes that mere understanding leads to growth. If you think 
of our world today, you think of the people who know the most, who are the most knowledgeable, the geniuses. We don't have to do much, re much research on these people to know that knowledge does not mean maturity, right? You can look at a lot of these people who maybe have it all together here, but have nothing going on here. And uh, if you think about it further, when I think about this, if I were to say understanding leads to growth, Satan pops into my mind. Wouldn't he jump to the head because didn't he go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Jesus on knowledge of the Bible in the desert? So wouldn't Satan be the one that we're looking to as, that's, that's an example of growth. He knows so much. It's not it at all. It's not it at all, and we're missing that. Think of the contrast between a Pharisee and disciple, the people he loved most and the people he rebuked most. A Pharisee, you break that down, the Hebrew word for Pharisee actually means separated for a life of purity, and get this, specifier. It means specifier, which meaning uh, that they would, um, they would specify the correct meaning of the law, and they would apply it in every fashion. Nobody in Jesus' time knew the law better, knew the scriptures better, and nobody spent all their time, energy, and lives to apply it to every aspect of their life. That's why you see constantly these battles that Jesus has with the Pharisees. Uh, they're presenting, hey, Jesus, what about this application of the law? What do you think about this application of the word? What do you think about this? Oh, Jesus, you know, this, you're, you're not following this aspect of the law. You're not applying this in your way. Your disciples aren't applying this. They're not washing their hands. They're, not, they're, they're doing stuff on the Sabbath. Everything that they did was understand and apply. And Jesus rebuked them the most. He rebuked them the most. And uh, they did everything right, but it was more out of responsibility. Look at a disciple. Break down the word. Learner, follower. Jesus' disciples walked with him every day. They ate with him. They spent time with him. They encountered him and the person of God, and it was a relationship. Who became more like Jesus, the Pharisees or the disciples? Time spent wins. Time spent wins with Jesus. And so being with Jesus makes you become like Jesus. And move it. We need to move it from a place of responsibility. I'm a Christian. It's my responsibility. It's not it at all. Jesus is saying it's not your responsibility. It's a relationship. It's your life. Meet with me. Be with me. Come to me. You pull back all the rules, the regulations, the resolutions, the rituals, the religion, the responsibility, and what do you have? A relationship. A relationship, that's it. And, and the second thing that the understand and apply rule to being a Christian does to us is it assumes that growth in Christ is dependent on our ability, our willingness to apply truth to our lives. We know that we can't do anything. We can't earn God's grace. That's why he had to come and die to kill the law to make a way that we could have a real relationship with him every day. And we can't do it on our own. We're never good enough. We're never going to be good enough for his grace. And that's why they call it a gift. A gift. He overcame and he killed the law so we could have relationship. He rebuked ritual and said, be with me. So following the law, this understanding of Christianity, it only creates two things. A Pharisee and a failure. That's what it does for us. That's why we get in these ruts and these vicious circles of like, I'm not good enough for Jesus. My past this, my present this, my afraid of my future this. I'm not good enough. I'm just going to understand more and I'm going to apply it more. I'm going to put my nose to grindstone. You're going to turn into a Pharisee or a failure. One of the two. And Jesus is speaking something so different. And he wants to transform you. I love this quote. It says, we sheep, we're sheep. Thank you, Jesus. We sheep don't need a better understanding of how to avoid getting eaten by wolves. We need a deeper trust and following to our shepherd. I want to know my shepherd more when I walk through the valley. When I get caught in a thicket, when I'm the, the one lost from the 99. I want to know my shepherd because that's the only thing that's going to get me through this life. Not understanding, well, I know a lot about my shepherd. I know that he's good, I know that he's this, I can recite all the, the worship, and I want to know my shepherd, and I want you to know your shepherd this morning. Worship team, would you come?
turn to John 15. This is, this is where it all comes down. I am the true grapevine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit. He prunes the branches that do bear fruit, so they'll, they'll produce even more fruit. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. I love this part. Remain in me. Abide in me, and I will remain and abide in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it's severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me, and I in them, will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like the useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. But if you remain in me and my words in you, you can ask for anything you want and it'll be granted. When you produce fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. When I read this in my feeble thinking and not contextually, I think of, okay, I know what a tree looks like and I know what a stinking branch looks like coming off the tree. And, you know, I've seen a vine before, so it's just a branch with a vine wrapping around it. Well, that's not how Jesus was teaching this, and the people knew it. You can throw up, do we have that picture of that, that vine? And so what it was is, is there was a big old vine that would run through this vineyard, big, thick vine. And what, what he's talking about branches are these little shoots that would come up from the vine. And from those shoots came fruit. And uh, if, uh, if one of those shoots was dying or wasn't producing fruit, what the, the gardeners would do, they would cut the shoot off, they would, they would cut everything off of it, strip it down, and then that next picture, they would cut into the vine. They would cut into the vine. This sounds like a metaphor to me. <laughs> they would cut the vine, and they would place the branch in the vine. Then the next picture, this, what it would, this is what it would turn into. It would grow and produce fruit and have life because it was attached to the vine. This is a picture of attachment to Jesus, not application of Jesus. That's what, a, that's what it is. And uh, Romans 7, 4 explains it perfectly. Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ so that you might be joined to another, to him. You might be grafted, attached to him who was raised from the dead in order that we might bear fruit for God. Not only can we not follow Jesus by application, we don't know ourselves through application of Jesus, but fundamentally we don't have life without Jesus. We don't have life without attachment to him. It's the foundation of everything else and fruit follows. Fruit follows that. See, because fundamentally sin in our lives doesn't make us bad. It makes us dead. And Jesus didn't come to this life to make our lives better. He came to give us life. John 10.10, the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. You break down the Greek word of abundantly there. It means in the sense of beyond. Super abundant in quantity and superior in quality. Jesus wants to give you life beyond what you're living now. If you attach yourself to Jesus, your life will be beyond what you're living now. And we, once again, we don't seek the quantity or the quality. We seek who's given it to us. We seek the person of Jesus. And all that stuff follows. Fruit follows. Attached to the source of of life. Would you stand up with me in this place? I'm going to read off some things that God honestly once again is speaking to me because it came to a point in my life where I felt I felt dry, I felt empty, and God spoke to me and said, "Man, it, it looks it looks like you're a lot more like a Pharisee than a disciple of me." And I said, "Ah, oh, that hurt." I said, "What does that mean?" And he showed me. I was not attaching myself to him. I was, I, I could understand and apply all day. But I wasn't attached. 
And so there's some things that God spoke to my heart that I know I'm applying instead of attaching. I have no hope for my future. I might think there's got to be more than this. There's no sense of purpose. I'm searching for something. I maybe find it in a substance, a person, media. I'm trying to find life on my way to death. Reading my Bible is a chore. I don't have enough time to spend with Jesus. I just don't. Jesus only gets Sunday, maybe Wednesday. That's what my job is. I never step out in faith, even in the tiniest ways throughout my day. People are interruptions to me, not a chance for their intervention. I got nothing new to learn about Jesus. I know. Now I just study more. And Jesus is only a compartment of my life. If any of these apply to you as they apply to me, we're, we're, we're applying instead of attaching. And I want to give you a chance to meet with Jesus this morning. I saw this billboard and it says, it only takes a moment to make a moment. And one of my favorite preachers says, you can't reschedule an appointment, or you can reschedule an appointment, but you can't reschedule a moment. And I want to create a moment with Jesus. We're not going to produce anything. It's just going to be you and Jesus getting more of him in your life, being more aware of his presence in your life, meeting him face to face. Ned Erickson says, get to know Jesus well, because the more you know him, the more you'll love him, the more you'll want to follow him, and the more you'll follow him, the more you'll be become like him. The more you become like him, the more you become like yourself. And so I want to do two things this morning. Um, and if you move, that's not, don't let Satan speak to you and be like, oh, if I move, everyone's going to think I'm a Pharisee. I'm going to be tossed out of this church. We're just meeting Jesus this morning. I don't care where you're at. We can meet Jesus this morning. Is that good? We don't have to think, care about what anyone thinks. And so two things this morning. You can either come down front, sit in your seat there, or move to a place and saying, I'm positioning myself to hear from Jesus. Because rarely is it God have a speaking problem. It's usually we have a hearing problem. And... Uh, we need to position ourselves to hear him. We, we, I say to the, the, the youth group a lot, well, why don't you give yourself a chance to just listen, stop talking and just listen, and then write down what he's saying. That's a powerful way to meet with Jesus. Simple. You could do that in your seat right now with your notes. Others is God speaking to you and through you. You could turn to someone in your seat or come down front for some prayer, and God will meet you maybe through someone or through a word that, they, that, that God is gonna give to someone for you. But whatever it is, let's just take a couple moments before you leave and encounter Jesus and let him change everything. Let him give you life, let him give you identity, whatever you need, let's put it under the umbrella of attachment to the vine this morning. So bow your heads with me. I'm gonna pray over you, then we're gonna take a moment and just worship for a second, and then I'll dismiss in a moment. God, we just thank you this morning that you came not to, to help us be better, not to, not to give us more knowledge, but God, you, gave, you came to give us life. I pray that we would become attached to you, Jesus. That would be our only focus every day, every moment. Am I attaching myself to my source of life, my source of identity, my source of fruit? God, I pray that you would speak and you would meet us in this place. You're a God of relationships, so you want to meet us. You want us to encounter you. I pray that we would move from a place of being more at looking like a Pharisee and more of a disciple and a follower of you. I pray that you would move mightily in this place in your name. Amen. Join us as we worship and just seek after the face of God this morning.